This episode of To The Last Drop is sponsored by the Listen Audio app, where you can stream all your favorite radio stations, catch up on all the latest news and entertainment, and dive into captivating podcasts like this one, all in one app. Download Listen, that's L-I-S-T-N, from the App Store or Google Play. The Listen Audio app, everywhere you are. It's time for To The Last Drop podcast with Liam Delcom and Brandon Nell. Happy New Year, everyone. This is To The Last Drop. I'm Liam Delcom and with me, uh, as per usual, is Brandon Nell. Uh, We've got a bit of a bumper show for you uh, as the first installment uh, of the new year. Uh, Brandon, it was a bit of a... A head scratch as well, because you kind of come out of a, a Christmas and New Year's break and <laughs> you sort of survey the land and, and you know, it's uh, rugby's changed for us. So there's actually a lot. Yeah, it's not those days where we always used to go back now and you do some pre-season stuff uh, before Super Rugby and you watch guys sweating at this time and, um, you know, in, in, in their practices as such. And uh, uh, we did our own bit of sweating a bit in, in the, uh, in, in, in the uh, Christmas season. Uh, we, shouldn't, uh, we should tell people that we did uh, carry it on to, to the last drop in December. We did have a, a very festive yes. afternoon. Um, with mm. the, we, we, we sampled some bottles of wine. So um, so we, we mm. certainly kept our part up, and we hope all our listeners did the same. Uh, yeah, mm. it, it's a new year. It's a, I'm not going to say new year, new me, because it's the same old me. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> yeah, rugby just goes full steam ahead, and we got to go back. And I must admit, I think like everybody else, you're sort of fe- feeling a little bit blurry-eyed that, Geez, are we back in the yeah, and then there's this whole thing which I, I never get used to of people get coming back in January and suddenly like now I want to work, now I want to, I've got energy. You know, I mean mm. I just yeah. I'm, I'm not like that. I to me I struggle to start the year and, and so if I do sound a bit like I'm struggling to start the year, it's not the wine. I just do this time of the of the year as such. Yeah, yeah. Look, I mean I suppose also the the game now has changed as the seasons of uh they're not quite in sync, but we, we're getting close. Um, so there's no proper break. People keep keep asking me, aren't you going away? Aren't you doing this? And the other? I'm like, no, there's not really time to do that. Uh, we've got to sort of plow through all of this and see where we can take a break further down the line. But, um, yes, there, there is a lot to get through. Um, obviously, there are a lot of talking points. Uh, you know, uh, if you look at form, of certain teams before the end of the year and the form that they've carried into this year, uh, you know, some of them, and we spoke about this earlier, um, there's a, there's a lot of improvement to be made. Yeah. And I think we start off with the two obvious ones that we were going to chat about, um, before we get into some, some, some deeper discussions. Um, the, the Hollywood bet shocks, uh, is, is the first one. Um, of course they ha- are having a horror run. The, the fact with so many spring box there at the bottom of the URC log that the dragons actually uh, are one above them now. Uh, just shows you how bad things are going in Durban. And, and, um, Liam, I know you had a chat to Marco Mazzotti last week, um, for the Sunday Times. Um, and it seems like there still is some patience there in Durban, but surely as, as times go on, if, if things don't improve, that patience is probably going to start wearing thin. Yeah. I had to sort of make the point in copy that, you know, um, and this was before the Lions defeat, which made it one win in nine, which obviously even compounded matters for them. Uh, but he, he seemed to be, before that game, still fairly upbeat. Um, I, I made the point in my copy saying that the, the the buck and the bucks stop with him because he is the majority shareholder. Uh, but he's very much committed to this uh, to this cause still. Um, I didn't get any sense that, uh, you know, he's, uh, he's growing tired or you know, weary of, of, of this. Uh, he did make the point that the uh, the results uh, have upset him. Uh, he was quite clear to, or quite keen to make that point, and that um, you know, whereas in the past he might have felt uh, you know a little bit uh, some unease. He's happy and confident that they've got the people in the right, the right people in the right areas to sort of uh, get them through this tough, uh, especially in the coaching department. Uh, he feels that they've got people there that are capable. Um, mm-hmm. And the turnaround will will eventually, uh, you know, will, will come about. Well, I think I think to be fair, I mean, I think we, anybody who's watched professional sport for years knows that no owner of a team is going to go throw their guys under the bus. Um, you, know, you wouldn't expect them to do that. 
But you can un- understand the angst around the the results as such. And, uh, mm. you know, when you're investing lots of your own money into a team, you mm. and when you've got the caliber of players that the Sharks have, you expect better mm. results. And the fact that they threw away 18-3 lead against the Lions, wonderful for the Lions to have that comeback. But um, mm. from the Sharks' point of view, um, you sort of sit and scratch your head at how did it even get to that point? Mm. It, to be fair, also, I, I think there, there has already been an element of uh, people being held under, under the, uh, the moving bus. Uh, if you think of uh, maybe the former, but the erstwhile Sharks coach, that coaches somewhere else now. Um, uh, uh, Marco, well. was quite keen to, Marco was quite keen to make the point that, uh, you know, if you look at some of the things that, that have been contributing factors to their lack of form, um, has been a bit of a perfect storm that has sort of uh, uh, drift them. And, well, they all drift them, of course. Um, and he mentioned injuries. Obviously, that's a, that's always a key one. Uh, but then also how the uh, the Bok absentees, whether that's through injury or also at the start of the season, um, you know, guys coming back from World Cup, they weren't available for the Sharks, and that are, that has also been a contributing factor. And um, you know, I suppose there are other franchises that were also hit by that. But I suppose the Sharks have have invested heavily, so you know they. They were always going to be affected by that. Yeah, um, but of course, fans won't. Fans won't put up with that. I mean, they they want results. One out of nine, uh, obviously, no. isn't good enough. So they they would be keen to see some kind of turnaround. I, I the thing, two things there is, I think one, the Sharks went out and bought all those Springboks players or developed them themselves. Mm. They wanted that Galacticos type, um, you know, superstar sort of sort of squad, and that comes with a yep. price, obviously, with an international season and, and, and until. The global season actually gets sorted out by World Rugby, if that ever happens. Mm. Um, yeah, that's always going to be a problem. Secondly, I think uh, they probably in, there's a bigger deficit between uh, the the so-called rest of their squad and their spring box. And John Plumtree mm. said it quite, yeah. quite honestly the other day after the Stormers game, where he said, "We can't can't keep on wanting our spring box to come save us." And their deeper squad problems is that there's, there's been a bunch of guys contracted, and for some reason, whether it's their own fault or whether it's uh, you know, the coaching or whatever, they don't fit into the current game plan. So I think we're going to see mm. a lot of departures in the coming coming, well, coming months. Uh, Plum's going to obviously put his foot down and, and do things he want the way he wants to do, and that's his right, and then that's what the mandate he's been given. So he's got to get them on the right path. Otherwise. It's his job. So um, mm. it'll be interesting to see the next couple of months. Sharks fans, I think you must brace yourselves. It's going to be some very interesting uh, movements in the next mm. months. But yeah, I mean, look, they, they, they've got a chance uh, this weekend. We'll talk about the predictions just now for, for the weekend to write things. Uh, they should in the, the Challenge Cup get a win there. But then again, they should have got wins in ne- a number of the games. Well, they never got wins in. So um, they had a, they had one on the plateau last weekend and then somehow uh, fumbled. Um, yeah. And then fumbled it again at the end. So I mean, yeah. Well, I for so, British Chamberlain. So yeah. Uh, look, the other interesting thing I, I, I thought that, that Marcus said, because I asked him, uh, you know, obviously the, the franchise is under pressure. Um, he's a man that invested in, in fact, he, he made the point in a previous interview, he said like he invested some of his life savings in, into this venture. Um, you know, what kind of involvement does he have? And he, he made the point that in the past he used to, um, you know, be a little bit more involved, but now it's kind of limited to one phone call a week to the CEO and maybe on a fortnightly basis, um, you know, he'll, he'll touch base with the coaches. Um, and that previously it was felt that maybe he was too involved. Um, so he's taken a step back. So when you said earlier that, you know, a plumber is going to make those big decisions now, um, that's going to have to be very much the case. I mean, he will have to uh, find a way to steer the sharks out of these um, choppy seas Um I mean, I suppose that's what he didn't say. It was a perfect storm for, you know, uh, just pluck that from thin air. Yeah, I, I think also, I mean, the, any good business, you'd want the owners not to micromanage um, and you'd want mm. them to trust the people that they put in charge. And I think that's probably what's happened. So you've got to give that a chance to develop. Um, but, yeah, I mean, you know, you've got to get the results. Professional sport is cruel. And, yeah. it's in, and they, as I said, there's only two types of coaches. One is is being hired and one is being <laughs> fired. So, um, yeah, I mean, Plum's got a task in his hands, and it's going to be tough for them. But uh, I saw some interesting comments from him uh, after the after the Lions game, saying, "Yeah, it's the leadership. He's very worried about the leadership." And yeah, 
I'm not quite sure that goes to the heart of it, but um, there certainly is something wrong. Yeah. It's difficult to stand on the outside and sort of judge a team for where their problems are, but he's got a task on his hands. Mm. Yeah, you, you you still get the general sense that they probably don't play with the cohesion of like the Stormers who find a way of, even when they're not playing well, they find a way of winning. The Bulls to a certain degree as well, but the Lions certainly play with a lot more cohesion. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I suppose, and, and that will have to be forged on a, you know, on the training field and then sort of later on, you know, in, in match day scenarios. Yeah. Um, but yeah, there's, there's, you know, p- people need to find each other there. There's no question. You're with Liam Delcom and Brendan Nell on the To The Last Drop podcast. So we got a special guest tonight, all the way from uh, uh, Toulouse, but he's the La Rochelle scrum coach. Uh, it's uh, ex Springbok prop, World Cup winning prop, Guthrie Stienkamp who coaches uh, La Rochelle Scrum and La Rochelle, of course, under pressure this week, having lost their opening two games of defending champions. Uh, and Liam and I caught up with him and chatted about just where they are and what's happening. Have a listen. Well, for the last segment of our show, we um, welcome a very esteemed guest, uh, former Springbok uh, and Bull stalwart, a man who is a World Cup winner. Um, he's got strong opinions on a lot of things, in particular on the Scrum. Um, and he will share some of his opinions on wine as well a little bit later on. Catherine Stienkamp, welcome to our show. Hi, how's it going, guys? Great to be here. Looking forward to our chat. Good to yeah. have you. Thanks for taking the time. Yeah. Catherine, I mean, just to fill people in on you, 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 a lot of people might have not have seen you because you've gone off to France and you, you've disappeared out of South African screens, but maybe just <laughs> fill our, our listeners in on our, our, yeah, what you've been doing the last couple of years. Yes, obviously, I had uh, six years at uh, Toulouse, at Stade Toulouse, retired in 2017. And, uh, you know, then I went into coaching, you know, went into uh, specific scrum coaching, helping individuals, working with uh, athletes um, all over the world from amateur level all the way to international, you know, helping them find solutions in the scrums and uh, obviously dip my toes in the corporate space as well, doing some team building. I enjoyed it, some seminars. But yeah, the last five years, um, I've been scrum coach uh, in France. I was coach at Colombia in Pro D2 for two years. And I've been very uh, fortunate enough to be part of uh, La Rochelle the last two years. Um, winning those two Champions Cup the last two years is unbelievable. So, uh, yeah, no, um, that's what I've been up to, you know, um, focusing on uh, helping our players and, uh, you know, giving my best that I can as a coach, you know, and to be honest with you, if I see how the game has evolved, I'm happy where I'm sitting mm. by my computer screen. Yeah. Uh, t- tell me about the, the move to, to La Rochelle. Obviously, you're a Toulouse man through and through. Um, you know, were you, were you a little torn? I used to be. All right, let's clarify that now. I'm uh, Je suis Rochelet. Mm. Now start Rochelet. But now it's, uh, it's unbelievable. Obviously, you know, I'm grateful for the time I've been in Toulouse. You know, it's been an amazing time. The people in Toulouse are fanatics. And, uh, you know, even though when I go back, you know, I, I don't have the impression that I stopped like six years ago. When I'm going there, I, I'm still signing autographs for an hour long. And when wow. I go to the reception, the chef will come to me and say like, are you hungry? I'm like, yeah, I'll have a small snack. And then he comes up with a massive <laughs> plate of charcuterie and foie gras and wine and everything. And like, what the heck's going on? So I'm still well received. And especially when I go to the restaurants in Toulouse, very well received. So I'm very grateful mm. for that. Clearly my investment into rugby, it's still paying off. <laughs> in mm. Toulouse. Um, but yeah, um, you know, La Rochelle is just on another level, you know, in terms of it's still a club that's growing. You know, the the last years we were mm. fortunate enough to win trophies, but and it's something great which we are building here, especially with uh, Ronan Agora, the head of things, what he's trying, the culture he's trying to develop. And like last year, I've been fortunate enough to win a few trophies in my career, but winning last year it was special because like when we went on the parade in the city, there was like 50,000 mm. people waiting for us. Yeah. And mm. like even the day before on the game day, um, there were 40,000 people in town watching it on big screens. So people would just come to La Rochelle just to be there. And, uh, you know, I've never experienced since 2007. We were well received in South Africa when we won the World Cup. Mm. But the La Rochelle people, they're on another level. It's, it's interesting because, I mean, it was, it was such an amazing game as well. I mean, you guys, I mean, we went down quite early uh, by quite a big margin, then fought your way back. Incredible when not many mm. teams do that in Dublin anyway. 
Yeah, that, that's Albert. It's quite an interesting. Though. That's a tough one. It was a tough one for me to swallow because I was actually in La Rochelle because I applied for my South African passport, and for some reason my file got lost in South Africa. So I had to watch the game uh, yeah, in my flat in La Rochelle. I was very pissed off, and obviously watching this game, and my my missus came up to La Rochelle with my son as well, just to you know give me some moral support. And at some stage, she went out onto the balcony, and. Uh, and we started to score. And I just said, you stay there. <laughs> <laughs> and she stayed outside for 35 minutes. <laughs> yeah, Watch the yachts come in. The game, I said, oh, you come back in. So, uh, well, yeah, it was a deep summer. So, I mean. <laughs> it was summer. So, yeah, no, that comes down to the type of the quality players we have, the leaders. You know, you've got guys like Greg Aldrit. Uh, Winnie Antonio and Peter Bugger. You know, Greg is still young, you know, still young. He's not even 30 yet. But just the, the, the and that's the, the thing about, about Rog. He's installed this belief into the players, you know, that we are capable of achieving anything when we apply ourselves. And that just by trusting the system, backing each other, just we have this phrase, right, next job, next job, let's go, let's go, let's go. And that's all they did. You know, players, they have confidence and trust each other. And obviously, you know, you can't win it all, but uh, that was definitely special. You know, um, it just shows the character of the players. You know, I was fortunate enough to experience something similar back in the day in 2007 in Durban, right? We won against the Sharks. I'll never forget that. But uh, yeah, we and that's the thing. You know, that's our core values in the club. It's it's work ethic. You know, it's being honesty, humility, and family. You know, that it's about mm. leaving here, creating a bond, a brotherhood. That because and it's something unfortunate always experience in uh, all franchises in the modern era. So you know, Roger's really trying to instill that in our culture that uh, it's more than just rugby. We are more than just, than just the teammates. Before I ask you about Padron, um you obviously now part of a very unique club as well. Uh, Super rugby success, a World Cup winners medal, and now obviously uh, a Champions Cup as well. I mean, how big is that club? If you if you put your head around it, or got your head around it. Uh, I'll actually be honest; it's actually quite funny. I'm, I'm probably um, uh, the in the coaching staff, the one with the most titles <laughs> that they count. <laughs> <laughs> so no, but that's that's been the goal. The goal of the club, you know, if you look at our coaching staff, we're all under fifty. There's no one over fifty in our staff. We're all still young. I think Roger's uh, 46, 45 around there. I'm forty two. And uh, we just got some of the other coaches that joined the 40 club. But, you know, it, it's, it's about we're all specialists in different fields. And, uh, and, and honestly, you know, I've always said uh, as, a, as a coach, I would have loved to find something. It's always been my goal to find something which I experienced back in the day with the Bulls. Not only as players, but the way the staff was connected, the way they communicated with the players, everybody working together. And that's what I found at La Rochelle. You know, there are no egos here. We can have some discussions. We can challenge each other. We're here to help each other, you know, reinforce each other where it's necessary and keep each other honest. And, you know, in terms of a working environment, uh, if I listen to what happens, a lot of other clubs, you know, we, we are very fortunate because we, the coaches, we train together, we work all together. And uh, when the moment varies, we will have the odd beer, rosé, <laughs> wine together as well. Okay. How has the dynamic changed for you? Sorry, Miranda. How has the dynamic changed for you? Not not you. I'm, I'm talking about the club. Um, because uh, obviously, uh, you know, a humble roots for the club fought its way through the leagues and obviously won the ultimate prize in European rugby. So it was almost as if it was, you know, the little guy having something to prove. Now you've done it back to back, the biggest title. Does that... Has that sort of caused a shift? Do you have to find sort of fresh motivation or a thing that challenges you? Oh, obviously, definitely. You you have to find it. For a lot of these players, the core group in the beginning, they just wanted to win one title, you know? And uh, we, it took even last year, we had to tell them, listen, guys, everybody can do it once. If you want to leave a legacy, you need to be consistent. And and we were driven by that second title. And uh, this year, and that's especially, we've realized all teams prepare way in advance for us. Unfortunately, beginning of the season, we didn't have the results we wanted. You know, there was the World Cup, all those type of things, like everyone else. But everybody would just step it up against us. 
And the players now have realized that. So that's actually forced them as well to step it up another notch because whether it's in the scrum time, defense, the guys are coming for us. So the target on our back has gotten bigger. Like speaking to a lot of coach post game, sometimes like even for our scrum, coaches will be preparing three weeks in advance. You know, I won't say which team, but one team was actually training 12 guys against eight in the scrum, you know, just to get us ready. So yes, definitely there has been a shift in dynamic, you know, a lot of players had to make sure, right, what's the next step? What do we want to achieve this season? And what do we want to achieve going forward as a, as a club? You know, but we are very, very well um, supported by our directors of rugby, Robert Moore and Pierre Venner as well, and our president, Vincent Merling. You know, they have a big vision for this club. So it's great. We have achieved something unbelievable by winning two Champions Cup. But now we need to go to the next step. So obviously in France, the book is a massive thing. So the guys are really driven by that. So go through. I mean, th- this season, obviously, you guys have had two very close contests. Uh, yeah, losing in in the in the rain there against Leinster and also then Cape Town, just you know, very close games, both of them. How much pressure is on you guys going into this weekend? Well, oh, we have pressure every single week. You know, if if you look at our season so far, you know, even the top fourteen, we it was a few games we lost then, and actually, if you take the two super well, two Champions Cup games and the two top fourteen games, we lost four in a row, and the guys bounced back against Toulouse, they bounced back against Po, winning our first away game. Obviously, there's pressure, but we know that all we can control is our next performance. And this week is Leicester Tigers. And the boys have had a massive shift. And, uh, you know, obviously losing against uh, Leinster Dome was tough for us because we take a lot of pride in our home games like any other team. So that was a, that was a really tough one. But, you know, it was an intense game under the rain, not uh, easy conditions. And, you know, the Stormers, you know, losing in that last minute was brutal. You know, um, <laughs> lots of respect for the Stormers, but being a former Bulls player, that was, that was a hard <laughs> one to swallow. Man. It was really hard to swallow. But, um, you know, and just on a positive note, I think I should mention that is that, you know, looking at the Storm, looking at a lot of the plays, and I'll be honest with you, we all know who plays for La Rochelle, plays for Toulouse, and like some of the Stormer players I didn't even know. And the way those guys were playing, getting stuck into that, some of them are still young, you know, as a South African. I was, I was very proud of that, you know, seeing those youngsters coming through, so many players playing abroad. So from a from a South African point of view, that was great. So, But yeah, to come back to your question, uh, we're on to the next job. Pressure, definitely. But, uh, you know, we got the players to manage, but uh, we also, you know, we're not arrogant. We know um, we have to work hard for this next game against Leicester Tigers. They've done well. They've won away against Stade Francais in Paris. And, um, you know, we need to make sure we get our basics right and uh, add a bit more detail to our execution of our game plan. Yeah. There have been uh, various responses to South Africa's entry into uh, European rugby, or the Challenge Cup or the Champions Cup. Um, and there have been some interesting comments emanating from France. I mean, how, what's been your experience? What's the sort of, uh, what are the elements that the South African teams have brought to those competitions that you, you think, whether it's, you know, whether it's improved it or whether it's um, taken it a step back, you know, whatever. I'll be honest, I'm a traditionalist. So well, I found it very strange uh, the way in South African guys, because I mean, I came to Europe back in the day to play in the European Cup, I wanted to play it. Now with the South African teams here, it's no longer the European Cup. But that said, it's great for rugby. Uh, South African teams have changed the dynamic. You know, uh, what, I, what I'm enjoying now in South African rugby is, yes, we have that physicality, that brutality, but we're starting to see now players actually playing with the ball, running with the, with the ball. I'm not talking just about the centers. We're actually seeing the wings getting the, the ball in hand, which is great, you know. And obviously, when it comes to World Cup time, we go back to what we know best, <laughs> you know, dismantling our position, and we might not be the most expansive rugby. But since the South African teams have come into the Champions Cup, it has created something different because it's opponent we didn't know in the beginning. You know, we didn't know where they stand. And, and this we, we have seen as well with the South African teams playing in the URC. It's allowed uh, that competition to boost. And it's actually lifted. I can't even remember what the competition was called before with the Irish teams and the Welsh, Welsh teams. But it was a very average competition. But having the South African teams in the URC have lifted things up. And now the same in the Champions Cup. You know, 
uh, like players, and I'll be honest with you, everybody respects South Africa and France and Europe all over the world. But especially after this World Cup, you know, there's so much more respect. But you can also see that South Africans have lifted their game all over. That's how we work. You know, winning a World Cup is so much more. It's almost like we're seeing every single South African player now saying, I want to be part of the next one. So those guys have upped their game. And we're seeing youngsters, players we might not even know that are bringing it. We saw the Stormers, you know, playing against Leicester away with the so-called B team. And they almost pulled it through. Yeah. So, yeah, from a coaching point of view, um, the South African teams are bringing something different. They bringing a massive physicality because traditionally when we're going to the European Cup, it's a very fast game. It's similar to what we experienced back in the day in Super Rugby. But having the South African teams come in, it just brought back that brutal physicality. Yeah, yeah I was going to say, you, you say that the respect there, I mean, I suppose maybe it's just me. The end was in France with the World Cup. I wasn't. But um, from yeah, it just felt, after South Africa won that quarterfinal, at least for the next couple of weeks, um, we weren't so popular in France. <laughs> <laughs> we, South Africa wasn't popular at all. Even like I, I had to train not to smile. I actually did exercises specifically <laughs> at my flat not to smile, not to smile. That was, that was very tough. I would actually go to the bathroom just to smile. So, um, <laughs> um, no, but, but that's it. I can understand it, you know. They've been building towards that. They've been putting everything in place. Even by us at the clubs, we've been developing players to play for the French team, not just to play for them, but to dominate at international level. So to be honest with you, being South African, obviously 100% happy, but being in France now uh, for 11 years, you know, there is a part of me that felt really for them. You know, I'm invested in the development of rugby in France because I mean, it's, that's my job. I was an academy coach as well. And a lot of our players of La Rochelle were playing this well. So I felt that joy and jubilation with South Africa winning, but I also felt that pain, you know, um, being in France. And it was, it was tough because they invested a lot of money, a lot of those players, you know, but this also comes down to the media that were hyped up quite a bit. You know, a lot of people say they're going to win it. And let's be honest, the uh, Ireland and France were the number one teams the last two years. Mm -hmm. So that was hard for them to swallow. And yeah. um, as I explained to them, I said, like, honestly, guys, don't take this personally, but South Africans play for so much more. This is not a game. This is not mm -hmm. for just to have the trophy in the cupboard. It's not just about having a medal. It's about inspiring a nation. You know, it uh, it takes me back two years ago as well. In 2010, we played in Soweto for the first time. Like, we didn't know what to expect, what was going on, because um, we couldn't play at Loftus, and we thought it was going to be chaos. But on that day, we saw people from different backgrounds come together, forgetting about their problems. And that is deep. But that, like, you don't even get that in rugby. I don't think there's a nation in the world that can comprehend that. But yeah, I'm going to get carried away and too, much, too emotional here. But <laughs> yeah, it was a tough uh, three weeks after that World Cup. Um, yeah, and, and I think people tend to forget that that quarterfinal, it was so, it was a brutal game. It was it's so brilliant. tense. There wasn't much in it. And, it, you know, it could could actually have gone either way. And it, it changes yeah. your, the arc of your, 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 your history in a way, if, um, you know, by, by just one point. No, it's crazy. And you know, just in South Africa, you know, hats off to the boys, you know, the players, you know. Uh, you could see everybody was connected, you know. I, I read the book of Rassi and I can understand how he works, you know, and, and, and that season. But I can tell you this, that, that um, you know, the boys, they gave it their best. And and also just whoever came in, they just kept on delivering. And, and you know, that's the, 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 that's the great thing. But I'll tell you this, uh, I, I actually made a demand to the club to take a leave of absence, you know, after the World Cup because I had emotional burnout, you know, after the quarterfinal. <laughs> and the series and the finals. You and the rest of South Africa. Right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, That's all of us in South Africa as well, so. <laughs> yeah, I've asked for another public holiday on the side, but <laughs> I <think> they didn't <laughs> give it. <laughs> Uh, the other, I mean, the one thing, I mean, we, we, this show is also about, and I'm sure Liam said it to you before as well, uh, is also about a uh, bit of the uh, good old red stuff in the bottle and the white stuff in the bottle and the rosé. Uh, yeah, yeah, you're quite a big fan of the, the rose wine. 
so to speak. Uh, yeah, um, the Rosé Le Côte de Provence, you know. So <laughs> it's actually quite very, I need to explain this to you guys. So in France, we have a um, thing called apéro. So this is what I love about the French people. Like They say, no, no, I'm not going to drink a lot. I'm not going to get pissed. Oh, we're not having a big party. We're just having an apéro. So apéro, that's a, a moment for people to get together. <laughs> Enjoy each other. Sorry, that, that, sorry, that while having drinks. Like a suburb in Cape Town. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so yeah, yeah, no, no, I love my wine, and that's the great thing about the frauds. You know, you know, it's winter now, so I'm enjoying a good Bordeaux, either nice uh, Saint Emilion Cru or uh, uh, Pomerol, which is also from the Bordeaux region. So, but you know, I'll be honest with you, like. I don't know a lot of the wines. I know what I like, but uh, sometimes it can get intense. So, you know, when guys are starting to smell and drink water and sip and air everything out, things can mm. get uh, quite intense. But what I love about the whole culture of uh, France is they got like a wine for every type of meal. Like sometimes I'll bring a wine to them. Like, no, 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 no. That's not the right type of red. I'm like, it's red. We're having meat. Mm. So, yeah. So well. So, but yeah, it's a big culture. But, uh, but like I said in the previous podcast when we, when we had a chat, you know, the one thing I love about uh, the, the French vibe is that, you know, they actually <laughs> enjoy it. You know, it's like for them coming together, it's about, about enjoying each other's company, having a pate, the apéro is about having snacks and all these type of things. But it's very important for these guys to, to, to enjoy mm. the products. And they're very, how can I say, proud of the heritage. So they're very um, stuck on like needs to be French. And But I'll be telling you this, they've been tasting some South African wines. Uh, they've discovered mm. the chocolate block and the uh, Hermanus Peters for the claim boot. So uh, <laughs> yeah. you're enjoying that. They think it's the best wine ever. And uh, to be honest, um, with us being in Cape Town, uh, our team really enjoyed it. The the reception mm. of the people in South Africa was amazed, amazing. Uh, we were well received. And honestly, as a South African, I was uh, I was unbelievably proud of everyone back at home, you know, but but really made a massive effort for the boys. The boys finally got to get some South African beef, like <laughs> so they were enjoying it. So uh, they went seventh heaven. I got a, a first hand experience of um, how intense it can get. Um, you know, people obviously get very not just provincial. I mean, even within a small confine, yeah. about uh, the particular wines of that particular area. Uh, yeah. driving through Cassis, and I made the mistake of saying to the taxi driver, oh, no, I've experienced the wines there because I had a you know a wine from Bandol. And it's literally across the next mountain peak. Yeah. And this guy was like, he looked at me like, no, 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 that's a very diff that's a different wine. <laughs> he made it sound like it's from a different continent. So they are quite particular, um, uh, you know, about the uh, about their vines. No, look, they're very, and even like with the Apero, I've got a friend now, he started a concept called Aperology. So he actually goes out to get the best wines to match the best, certain pâtés and certain cheeses. So they're like, oh. it, it gets intense. You're like, um, luckily for me, I've been his guinea pig, so I had to uh, quality test all these products over the last three months. <laughs> and, Who are you? <laughs> and then do some in-depth research to try and establish whether the people mm. out there would find value in this type of product. Yeah, I'm just having a brainstorm here. I think we need to, uh, to the last drop needs to organize a rugby tour at some point. Uh, uh, so mm. this tour where we go yeah. watch a couple of club games and in between we, we go up a row. Mm. Delta. Look, I'm I'm desperate to go watch a game at La Rochelle. That's that's one of the, the okay. one of the things that has to happen at some point. No, definitely. Let me know when you guys need. If you need tickets, just let me know two years in advance. <laughs> <laughs> we'll watch from your flat. Don't worry. It sounds like it's good. Yeah. <laughs> no, on a serious note, uh, like uh, even for us as coaches, we struggle to get tickets because um, like 80% of our, our tickets, it's all uh, like annual memberships and you know, like season ticket holders. Oh, that's so that's like fantastic. A wait, it's a waiting list. So, We've had over 80 games sold out now, home games, uh, consecutively. And you're actually on a waiting list. So either someone has to move or die in order for you to get an mm. opportunity. How big is the press box? That's probably the most important question. <laughs> There's no press here. <laughs> <laughs> no, there is press, but you guys are definitely not in a box. <laughs> you guys need to suffer in the cold. <laughs> 
<laughs> uh, oh, yeah, this is obviously we're running out of time. So, but yeah, I think uh, let's wrap it up. Th- thanks, great. Um, I think we can probably speak for hours here, and we probably will <laughs> yeah. see you again. Thanks for coming on, and thanks for sharing all this with us. And uh, good luck for the weekend. Uh, let's no, thanks. I, pre- uh, I appreciate it, and uh, as always, you know, all of my best to everybody in South Africa. Once again, thanks for all your guys' continuous support, and. Uh, you know, just stay safe that side, keep on building each other up, and uh, always tell us uh, inspire each other. Uh, that's the most important thing we can do. And uh, yeah, lots of love to everybody back home. You're with Liam Delcom and Brendan Nell on the To The Last Drop podcast. So Liam, prediction time. It's a, it's a big weekend. It is. Um, and there are some teams who, uh, who have lost some ground uh, in the initial uh, weeks of uh, the Champions Cup, as well as the Challenge Cup. But um, you know, there are some high profile teams, uh, as we, you know, we alluded to it as well in the, you know, the Gathra Steenkamp uh, interview. La Rochelle, uh, cannot afford another slip up. The, uh, defending champions, or double defending champions, they have their backs to the wall. So they need a positive result. Yeah. Well, let's go through pool by pool. Then it's probably easier. Uh, pool one is the, the Bulls pool. And, uh, over there, we start off with a, an, an interesting one, unbeaten Bordeaux Begles, or Be- Be- Begles, I'm not sure how, I'm just call them Bordeaux, um, play Saracens, which is a, a very tricky tie on side. That's a tasty one, that, yeah, yeah very Saracens tasty one. Saracens under pressure, big time. But they are, they are, they're quality side, they've got all this history, they, uh, they don't mind being with their backs to the wall. Uh, I feel, though, that... You know, the, the pressure they're under at the moment uh, perhaps is a little different from, you know, the previous times they have they have felt the squeeze. And they're up against the side that, um, you know, when they play at home, they they are very difficult to beat. So And, and, and Bordeaux for the last, I think the last three or four seasons, they've really, um, you know, advanced their cause in the top 14 as well. I mean, they're not a team that, that sort of um, languishes towards the end, at the bottom end of the table or you know, sort of meander in, in the table. they proper contenders. So I'm going to go with Bordeaux. Yeah, well, listen, I mean, from a South African point of view, you're probably hoping, and I know it's going to sound a very weird thing to say, but if Bordeaux do beat Saracens, it's probably good for the Bulls because they come to Loftus the next week. And if they've already qualified, uh, chances are the way the French sides work, they probably will send a younger, less experienced team out to Pretoria. Very good chance of that happening. Yeah. And that will help the Bulls even better when they qualify. So, yeah. Uh, but that's a tasty encounter. Then uh, the other one, uh, uh, on Saturday, Connacht faced Lyon. Connacht must win. Lyon are in, like the Bulls in the mid table. They won one, lost one. Uh, so also spicy, spicy, uh, mm, kind of, kind of yeah. didn't really do well against Bordeaux. Bordeaux, uh, hammered them. So, yeah, if, if, if this game was, if it was, the, if it was a home game for Connacht, I would have gone with him, no doubt whatsoever. Um, and in fact, I, I think I might still go with them. I mean, uh, Leon again, like a bit like Bordeaux as well. I mean, you're not just going to show up there and, and take the points. Um, but you know, I think Connacht at the moment have a, They've got quite a bit going for them, so I'm going to go. I'm going to go with them winning by like three or four points. Not they'll be much. Uh, I must admit, I still think the on the on tough to beat at home. I mean, the Bulls did everything right and still couldn't get a win there. So, although I mean, there were, were a couple of very interesting uh, refereeing calls, in that, <laughs> uh, which tend to happen in these European games. You, you're going to get used to it every time I say something about it. All our all our sort of colleagues in the in England and Fro- and Wales and Scotland keep on saying to me, but oh, you need to this. This happens all the time. So I suppose mm-hmm. we've got to get used to some yeah. of these calls. Uh, and then of course Bristol playing the Bulls. Um, I, I think Bristol they are eighth in the in the in the in the Premiership, but they did beat Sale Sharks last week in Manchester, which is first time Sale have lost mm-hmm. the. A long time, so I think they will start yeah. the Ritz. Looks like a sellout crowd as well for them, and um, they're a tough side to beat at home when they when their backs are up. So um, uh, I reckon mm. the Bulls got their work cut out. And plus, yeah, the way the Bulls, the team that they're going to probably take, second string team, you expect them if they don't do everything perfectly, uh, probably ten to fifteen points. Yeah, the Bristol Bears, big, big, heavy spenders. Um, maybe not as much as you know, as the case a couple of years ago. But you know, they uh, they have some big name players there. 
Uh, I, I don't see a way through for the Bulls here. I, I tend to agree with you, maybe by, say, nine points, maybe ten. Yeah, I, I just I, I think it's one thing to for the Bulls to do it once off against the on. I think Bristol's a new place. I think I see it's going to be close to freezing minus two. I think everything counts against the Bulls <laughs> in terms of that. And they're going to have to be almost perfect to do that. Um, can mm. they do it? I'm sure they can. But um, you, you tend to see that you know, our players don't like playing in those sort of temperatures at times. And the uh, Bulls are perennial bad tra- travelers. So, uh, well, it's hoping we're wrong. I'll, I'll gladly eat my hat if we're wrong. So, um, uh, <laughs> be quite interesting. Okay. Okay. Liam, pool two. Um, yeah, big game, huge one. Johan van Kran's, uh resurgent Bath rugby, uh, hosting Sia Kulisi's Racing 92. That's a tasty one on Sunday as well. It is. Uh, if it was a home game for the uh, Parisian club, I would have said uh, they would win, but they are not the best travellers. Uh, Bath, as you made as well uh, pointed out there, I mean, they are experienced a bit of a a revival, and it's a it's a popular one because they are a much revered club in England. Um, I, 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 I believe the home team will be near. I think Bath uh, at home, you know, g- given their form. I mean, it's a, you know they're still a bit up and down, but I think they'll have enough to beat us. Yeah, I also, I mean, obviously from a South African point of view, there's lots of South Africans in that team as well. Um, yeah, you, you hope uh, for their their part as well. CS team, of course, if they lose, they're basically out then because uh, they've lost their opening too. So they, they're they not in a good position. They're very desperate. That should be a very interesting one. Also with the French teams, it'd be interesting to see what team they take to, to path as well. Uh, we'll only know on Friday. Yeah. Yeah, it will be – you can probably get a sense then of whether they've given up or not because um, uh, there's a huge emphasis in, in France on the top 14. So, you know, they, they tend to pick their battles here. Yeah. Um, yeah. To lose, they're going off to Ulster. That's another nice one on Saturday. Uh, that's a, that's a huge one. Uh, that's but, a very, very big one. Yeah. I mean, uh, look, I mean, Ulster, notoriously difficult to beat at home and in those conditions. Uh, it's never, uh, the, the conditions are never friendly. Let's put it that way. So you kind of have to prepare yourself for, for wet and for the bluster and for, uh, you know, a crowd that's on top of you. So, but to lose, I mean, they are, well, they are the, not the, the most decorated team in the competition for, for no reason. So if there's any team that can go there and, and, and beat them, it probably is to lose. Um, and Ulster have lost at home this season. Um, so they, again, they're probably not where they are supposed to be. I'm going to go to lose. Yeah. I was going to say, if there's any pack that is going to relish mm-hmm. that sort of, Wind and rain, yeah. and that is the close to thousand kilogram Toulouse mm. juggernaut. And you know, I mean, there's some big boys in that pack, they're not going to be scared of that. They'll quite enjoy mm. uh, the, the old fashioned sort of rain and stuff. Uh, other, other game, but, but yeah, again, we'll probably have to see how they, you know, what team they put up. Yeah, again, same sort of thing. But that, mm. I think we should asterisk all these, all these games with that. <laughs> um, yeah. Holocaust travel to Cardiff on Saturday. Uh, when would see them through to the next round, uh, and and yeah, and they'd be qualified basically before the time. So, both to lose and Harlequins could bro- probably qualify if they will get wins. Yeah, I'm I'm thinking Harlequins here. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Cardiff, uh, hot and cold at this, you know, a little while back, but then mostly cold the last while. So, I'm gonna go Harlequins. Yeah, we're gonna go through, we're gonna go through quickly pool three as well. Uh, obviously, uh, yeah, both Northampton Saints and Exeter Chiefs have a po- uh, have a chance to qualify as well. They've got hundred percent record. Uh, Northampton uh, they they host Bayonne, uh, which should be an interesting one again. Which team will the French team send? But I think Northampton mm-hmm. probably that one. Yeah, agree with you. Uh, yeah, uh, Exeter host Glasgow Warriors. That's a spicy one. That should be quite interesting. That's a very oh. intriguing one. I think this game, in many ways, will give you a proper sense of what the English Premiership, the, the strength of the English Premiership, and then the strength of the URC. Because uh, Exeter, you know, one of the the leading clubs, or have become one of the leading clubs in England over the last uh, couple of years. Uh, Glasgow Warriors punching. I'm going to say well above their weight, actually, uh, in many ways in the URC. Um, so it, it is a very interesting matchup. And as much as I would almost routinely say a, a home at Sand, a win at Sandy Park for, for Chiefs, uh, I'm not so sure. I think Glasgow Warriors are entirely capable of going there and, and winning. Um, I'm going to go Warriors. 
I was going to say, I'm also going to call for the upset just from a purely UFC mm. hat on. Um, mm. And uh, I just think uh, there's something Franco's busy with something uh, special there at Glasgow, and uh, hopefully that'll mm. carry them through. But it is a tough task for them. And uh, and yeah. also the, the just the, the playing styles. I mean, it's, it's two teams that uh, usually you know have a, have a proper crack. So yeah. um, hopefully the conditions um, allow them to. Uh, yeah, and then the final game in pool three, uh, 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 what would normally be a tasty one, but with the amount of injuries that <laughs> yeah. Munster, Munster have, two uh, bottom to Toulon to, to, to uh, on on Saturday. Um, yeah, tough one. Um, I think Munster, mm. just, I mean, they've got something like 44% of their squad is injured at the moment. It's something ridiculous. Mm. And I uh, see John Klein's the latest one to go down. Um, yeah, yeah, just so a real, real bad injury count for them. Uh, they're gonna yeah. need to stand up as, and fight, as the the anthem says, and they they're gonna need a brave performance in Toulon. But I can't see them winning there at, at this stage. If if there is one game that you would want to attend in this round of games, it's probably that one. I mean, I was lucky enough at the World Cup where a group of uh, blokes from Munster uh, sat in a pub next to the Felix Mayor watching the Ireland game. Um, and it was a fantastic experience, a proper rugby bar. And I suppose this weekend, a very similar vibe will, you will find it in, uh, in Toulon. Uh, as far as the result goes, I think the, the home team will, will pull this one through o- only because Munster, um, that, yeah, they're going to send a team there that probably isn't, they don't have the form and you probably don't have the personnel. Yeah, and I think, uh, in, in pool four, uh, there is some spicy ones. Uh, we start off with Leinster. Who can qualify if they win, and they can eliminate Stade Francais at the same time. Uh, yeah, mm. that that be very interesting games in Dublin. Leinster should be favourites for that. And again, mm. which team would Stade Francais send? Given the they haven't had the best of European seasons. I think Leinster. I think are the sure yeah. sure bets there. And um, yeah, uh, I think the other one, DHL Stormers, uh, Sell Sharks, there is a spicy one we'll all be watching as well. Mm. Lots of South Africans involved. Uh, tough. That's one the interesting involved. dynamic there because uh, most of the Saffers would have had a, oh, I was going to say, a taste of, certainly a taste of Cape Town. Uh, don't know how many of them would have played at Cape Town Stadium though. But but either way, I mean, it's 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 people who, um, you know, are playing familiar a territory, so you know, but the Stormers will still have a home ground advantage, but at you know, the, the Sail Sharks will, will arrive there not feeling as foreign, yeah. No, I'd, I'd go for the Stormers when they're just purely on home ground yeah. advantage, but um, I think we're going to see um, a very, very spicy game there because there's lots of South Africans, lots of rivalries over there, and lots of players with points to prove, absolutely, yeah. Um yeah, so no, it's interesting. The other one, uh, Stade yeah. uh, La Rochelle, Stade Rochelle, uh, must beat Leicester Tigers to stay in the competition. Leicester Tigers are pretty decent themselves. Uh, mm. They'd want the victory as well. Um, a huge game. Andre Pollard probably uh, there uh, for Leicester as well. Um, Jasper Visa, lots of South Africans there to watch as well. But just a fascinating one with the defending champions backs against the wall. Absolutely, uh, both teams I think have two uh, European Cup wins, uh, so there's um, you know they come with proper uh, pedigree. Uh, I think it's that stage of the season where if if uh, La Rochelle is going to have a season where they come anywhere close to emulating what they achieved last season, this is the game in which they have to stand up and show that you know that. You know they haven't completely lost the plot, so I expect a massive performance from them. So that's what I'm going to go with. Him. Yeah. Uh, do we have time for EPCR? Well, I think we've got a couple of minutes left. Let's go through quick, quick fire EPCR. You can just give me uh, Newcastle, Benetton. Uh, I will go Benetton. Oh, an interesting one, that one. I'd probably also go Benetton. Ospreys. I'll go Benetton, and in fact, I'll go by, by 12 points, at least. Yeah. In Swansea, Ospreys, uh, USAP, that's with Pepping off. Oh, say again, sorry? Uh, US, USAP is Perpigno, isn't it? Perpigno, yeah. Uh, Perpigno, Ospreys. Uh, I'm going to go Ospreys. Uh, they've been on a decent run of late, and Perpigno uh, struggling on all, on all fronts. Sharks or Yanaks? I think Sharks pretty much. 
Uh, yeah, the Sharks should win this one. Yeah, I think we might see a young team coming out as well. Um, yeah. Seeing as the Yannick has lost both their games as well. Clermont yeah. Scarlet. In Clermont. Uh, Clermont. Scarlet have lost a little bit of their luster uh, yeah. as far as I'm concerned. So uh, Clermont at home notoriously difficult. Zebra Dragons, two of the bottom dwellers. <laughs> I'm going to go Zebra. My own ground advantage, I think, will count for a lot there. And the, yeah, and the Dragons just, <laughs> yeah. Um, hard then, to watch. An intriguing one, Cust against Black Lion, George's Black Lions. Mm. Uh, I'm going to go with Cust. I think they will uh, win it. Uh, I'll go for Black Lions just because I like the Georgian teams. Yeah, I remember the last game as well, you were Black Lions, and I think they won, actually. Yeah. Edinburgh, Gloucester. Uh, I think probably Gloucester. They look a bit in better form than Edinburgh at the moment. Mm, this is a difficult one. Uh, yeah, you're right about Gloucester. Their form is decent. Uh, no, I'm going to go the home side this time. I'm going to go Edinburgh. Montpellier and Lions, both unbeaten. Uh, Lions taking a, a much depleted side in terms of experience. Um, so Montpellier, you know, if they took the if they took the front line 15 or 23, if you want to call it that, I would have gone Lions. But jeez. Uh, uh, I think I'm going to have to go with Montpellier on this one. And last one, Cheetahs Pal in Amsterdam. Cheetahs. 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 Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oranja. Yeah, there we go. There we go. That should be interesting in Amsterdam at least. So. Yeah, absolutely. Well, that's our predictions, Liam. You confident in all your predictions? So, we're going to, uh, would we go bet? Not about? entirely, no. Um, I was going to use that excuse. It's it's early in the year. We haven't seen enough, but of course, we have seen enough. <laughs> There's enough form uh, to, um, to, go, to go on. Uh, but I think, as we said earlier, I think it's a big weekend for a number of big clubs uh, or franchises. And um, yeah, we'll, we'll know a lot more uh, sort of by the end of the weekend. I, I think, uh, yeah, there's been a lot of criticism of the format and, and the way it's structured at the moment. It's, okay. it's definitely not perfect. Um, but the fact that you've got those, all this jeopardy and teams that desperately need to win sort of heightens the stakes. And you've got a number of exceptional clashes this weekend. So I'm looking quite forward. I'll be glued in front of the TV when we are can. And, uh, um, obviously we can, we can't be glued in front of the TV, but yeah, uh, it's going to be very interesting and hoping for a great round of rugby. Lots to talk about, hopefully. Um, uh, you're going to say thanks to Guthrie as well for joining us. Um, that was great of him as well. Uh, I know he's a busy man. Yeah. I, 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 it's still, uh, you know, Guthrie drinking all that rose is still an image that, uh, yeah, <laughs> it takes a while to get used to it. Yeah, I must admit, he's, he's one of those characters of rugby. And I don't think people realize, uh, how much he's, he's loved in France because he's, he's, he's quite mm. a character there as well. And he's totally embraced the culture. So, um, yeah. it was good having him on. We, we spoke a lot about Malcolm was, um, uh, Malcolm is, no, Malcolm, Malcolm is not <laughs> easy for you to say. <laughs> not really. Um, I think we're going to have to get him on at some point to come talk to us as well. Uh, but yeah, mm. been a good week. I hope you guys are all going to enjoy the weekend. Uh, yeah, you as well. Uh, and hope we find a, Thank glass, you. And for a glass of wine. I will certainly do that. I think there'll be, um, yeah, there'll be, a, there'll be a couple of games that will, um, leave the throat dry, I think, towards the end. Well, dry January just means something you're blunt. That's all it really means. So, um, <laughs> anyway, on that note, goodbye. We'll chat to you guys next week. This has been To The Last Drop. Cheers. Thanks for listening. And a reminder, you can find all the To The Last Drop podcasts on the Brendan Nell YouTube channel, iono.fm, Spotify, player.fm, Pocket Casts, Google Podcasts, and iTunes, or wherever you find your favorite podcasts.